All right, so I'm Trisha Radcliffe. I'm a Docker captain. I'm the MC today. Uh, I am here to introduce uh, Jeannie Schwenk, and she is a scrum master at, I gotta pronounce this right, Gyra. Gyra, thank you, semiconductor. And um, I know her for a little while now. She's a fellow Portlandian. And so I'm really excited to introduce her. Um, she's here to share uh, customer stories about transforming a 15 plus year old uh, semiconductor manufacturing environment. So take it away. Yeah, and I'm actually here. It's partially Trisha's fault because two years ago she had a meetup and I went, what's this Docker thing? And I went and that's what started this whole adventure. So let's see, we need to hit, uh, that. There we go. So I'm a Scrum Master, Agile Project Manager, and Software Engineer, so I do a little bit of everything. And I'm going to be talking about how we took all of our legacy software that is the primary stuff that runs the application, of the, the manufacturing process on the floor, and are moving it into a hybrid of solutions, some in containers, some into VMs. So I have a professional passion for managing and developing software projects. I've been doing it for a while, and my goal when, when building them is to design, to design them and build those software projects so that they're, they're looking to the future and build the right thing, build it correctly. It's very easy to do that differently. So before I go on, I want to, do we have any Star Wars fans here? Please tell me I'm not the only one. Okay. Thank you. He's like, okay. They said, bring up something personal. So I uh, love Star Wars and I love making cosplay costumes. So I brought these together. I'm part of the Capes and Crowns Foundation. We're a, a group that does cosplay photo shoots for kids with life-threatening illnesses. And last year we had a, a fundraiser and the 501st was coming. So the fi and my daughter then, when she found out, said, mom, I want to be Ahsoka Tano. And she brought me a picture. Now I've never done Montrals and Lacou. So I made this an agile project because everything looks agile to me. So what's the goal? What are the deal breakers? How do I make small steps forward? How am I gonna reach my goal? What's the next thing? And make sure whatever I do works end to end. Even if it's not deployable, or in this case, it's not wearable. So slow start, but there she is. And in case you don't know who um, Ahsoka Tano is, she was actually Anakin's Padawan. And this is her Rebels, if you've seen Star Wars Rebels. Am I the only one who watches cartoons too? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm a little addicted to Star Wars. And uh, here we are, final project. And uh, I was very happy with, the, happy with the final results. And seriously, who doesn't want their picture taken with Chewie? I mean, this is, it was so fantastic. So uh, we're gonna go back to the tech topic. Um, I work at Gyra Semiconductor. We are located um, in Hillsboro, Oregon, not far from Portland. And we have just under 500 employees. And our CEO's goal is to bring manufacturing back to the US profitably. What is not set up there is they also share it with the employees. So uh, I, we're definitely all behind that. So we're in power. Uh, we make power chips from end to end. So you can see here, we're in a little bit of every industry. Your phones, fast chargers, your washer, your dryer, your instant pot. And so uh, that's it for the company. We're gonna go into timeline. The fab we're in was actually built by another company in the early 1990s. And uh, their last uh, software upgrade, didn't involve all of the software as you'll soon see, was in 2007. And they were a company that was wanting to get away from having fabs and move into foundry. And AOS at the time was one of, their, one of their companies that they were doing some foundry work for, but AOS didn't want to be in foundry anymore. They wanted to have their own fab. So a deal was brokered and in 2011, AOS formed Gyra and became the proud owner of all of the tools, the legacy software, the legacy servers. And during this time, they needed to then adapt those designs, purchase and install tools, automate new tools. So budget was a little thin. They really need to conserve their budget to make sure that they could conform everything they had to their product line so we can get items out to the customer. So as they were ramping, the systems were really stressed and the team uncovered and fixed uh, a lot of very unusual errors. And uh, in 2017, I was contacted to come in and uh, I, did not, I declined the first time and they were pretty persistent over the summer and finally said, just, just come in and look at the problem space. Let us tell you what we've got here. And so I, I agreed to go in and I went in for an interview 
And he was talking about the project was going to be an individual contributor role. And I wasn't really looking to step down into an individual contributor role. So I talked about Agile and Scrum. So he changed the role to include that. So pretty obvious what happened next. Here's the rest of the team. On the far side, Mark is actually here with me. And uh, I've pulled uh, Swathi, she's in the middle, and Mark on the end into the Docker space as well. This summer, I'm going to teach a Docker fundamentals course and pull all of them in. So the development part of the role, what I was told was take the software, get it off the legacy hardware, move it into VMs, and no impact to manufacturing while you're doing it. So one thing I've learned about software is you, if, you do, if you develop and deploy and give them exactly what they asked for without understanding the underlying need, you're probably going to deliver them the wrong thing. And it's a really painful experience. So I always counter with, what's your goal? And it came down to, we want to get off the hardware, we want to scale, we need flexibility, we need freedom. So here we are. Can't help it, I love Star Wars. We need to upgrade, we need to scale, and we can't. So we have silos. The silos formed out of necessity. You had lean times, company change, followed by more lean times. Software is not the thing that's going to get upgraded when things are lean. Waterfall development process. Uh, message bus, two major revisions behind. Database, three major revisions behind. PA risk architecture, which was great in 2003. The problem is, is it's not made anymore. And our MES, our manufacturing execution system, is a COBOL program from the 80s and 90s that was heavily customized by the previous company, and Gyra has continued that trend. The applications that assist the MES are Java 1.4.2 applications, some of whom have to be 1.3 compatible, and we have C drivers tied to the hardware. So what are we going to do? Keep the goal in mind. It's an agile project, so you always have to be thinking about where are we going, what's in the future, do we have a future, where are we going to be in five years? So my long-term goal was to build an agnostic underlying infrastructure. Can we put parts in, take parts out, upgrade, no impact to manufacturing? And at this point, you can see it's going to start becoming a team effort. This is no longer just port this to a VM, it's much larger. And uh, isn't that what happens to most projects, right? They tend to grow. So we have a goal, where are we going to start? Uh, of course, you need to know, no matter where you are, your systems and your applications, you need to understand what's there. And I consider things like bare metal, vSphere integrated containers, uh, looked at the difference between Swarm and Kubernetes, considered the team size and, and their background, and went with Docker containers in a Swarm. And point five we're going to deal with at the very end, we've got a legacy operating system, it's HPUX, 1111 running on HP 9000 machines. And so we're, we're going to have to do something with that. So we always talk about the tech, because what about tech? Uh, we always know we can do that. But there's another side. You've got your people, and you have your processes. And with people, they're a little bit different than, than dealing with processes. With processes, we just keep hammering on it until it yields, or we find a different route. You can't try that with people. I've tried. It doesn't work out very well. And so people don't like change. They are going to resist change. So when you have, especially when it feels like it's being forced upon them. So when you come in and you, you know you're changing processes, if you start changing some of the people process as well, uh, it's going to be difficult. There's an old religious text that talks about this group of people that was in slavery, and they get out of slavery, and they're going into freedom, and run into a few difficulties. And what do they say? I want to go back. And the reason I, I use that as an analogy is it's an old, you know, a really, really old story, but it's still true. We're all like that. We don't like change. We like what's familiar. We like, we like what is comfortable, and we want to stay there. So I was telling my dad last spring break, I hadn't seen him since the previous summer, what I do. And this was his comment. And it was really neat to hear the, the, the CEO of Docker talk about this this morning. It's a competitive world out there. If you aren't looking to improve how you do things and you're not willing to change, you will become irrelevant. And that's true in the software industry. It's true pretty much in any industry now. So as we go through the responses from the team when I did that team assessment, I want you to remember that they're just like me and they're just like you. And it is the human response. When you feel forced to change, you come up with all kinds of reasons why you can't. And I have to point out, this team is incredibly intelligent. They're fun. 
They're, they're quirky. I enjoy spending time with them. Sometimes we've even had the chance to play at cards at lunchtime. And so I, I enjoy them. I like them a lot. Uh, but really, uh, to a person with the exception of my manager, they made it clear that I couldn't do my job. And so the difference is, is I know all things are possible and I know that we're capable of change. So that's my little aside of, you know, if you've got a technical issue, don't forget there's, a, there's the dark side you have to worry about too. So we're gonna go back to the tech side. And so here is the beginnings of our system. We've got three servers, they run the DBS applications. We have three of them and we have three copies each. They're identical copies. And so if we lose one of these servers, we can still limp along in the fab. It is noticeable to manufacturing, but we can still make do. Then we have four servers that have all the equipment controllers and the drivers. So if we lose one of these, we essentially lose a quarter of the fab. And of course, it would always be the wrong quarter if that ever happened, right? So this is just a small section of, uh, these are our initial targets, really, of what we're trying to bring forward. Then we have a thing called WSM Serve. It is the translation bridge between all of those other things that came up first and what you're about to see next. Here's our big boy. This is our MES, it's Workstream, and it's got the database and it uses shared memory. So the current version of the database, by the way, is 12.10 and we're back here. So where do you start? You know, it really kind of depends. Um, does, which of those applications has a future? Which needs to be changed? Uh, do we have a long-term plan? And for the MES, we're really tied to that. It's been around 80s and 90s. When you look at the window, when it comes up, it's essentially a VT100 window that you tab through. So definitely not a, a modern, you know, there is no mouse. Uh, you just tab through or use the cursor. And it's heavily customized. We're not going to change that. For those ones that were along the top, they do what we need. Minor changes periodically. Not going to replace them, though. It's a lot of code. A lot of, a lot of man hours go into that. Then we have the drivers in those EQCs. There's the target. Those are not only going to be moved into containers. Once I get them all split up and into containers, then we can pick them off one at a time and replace them with something new. So for Jira, there wasn't a better plan because we need to keep producing. Orders keep coming in. We're trying to increase our output. And with those monolithic servers, uh, given that they are on legacy hardware that isn't made anymore, we're on borrowed time. So we have to, we have to do something. So then we have our communication. All these black lines, this is our key to being able to containerize. We talk over a message bus. So we use mostly in the fab VFI, and that's Virtual Factory Equipment Interface. All of our applications talk in that. Here's our first set. Remember those three applications I was talking about? There's all three of them, each split across the servers. Those are the ones not going to change. They're in Java 142. Then we have our equipment driver, our equipment controllers, and our drivers. And we have 250 pairs. So there, most of them are one-to-one. -one. There are a few exceptions. Uh, but in general, those are together. They sit on all, all of the servers. Then we have a user interface. Uh, oh, by those equipment controllers, by the way, are in 142, but have to be backwardly compatible to 1.3 in Java. The drivers are C, and they were compiled on the PA RISC architecture, so we can't port them until we replace them. The user interface, no need to change it. It's what communicates information to the text on the flab floor. We get the images off an LTSB server. They run on thin clients, no need. The WSM serve, 20 identical copies. Doesn't that sound like something that should run in a swarm, right? And then our big MES. So the WSM serve is what translates VFI into CMMSG so the MES can understand it. Those EQCs, by the way, are the equipment controllers. Sorry, we call them EQCs because it's fewer syllables. Uh, those are state full and the drivers are state less. Now, we need a smooth transition off the hardware, and my first step was, let's go learn Docker. So yeah, I kind of decided Docker was the right choice before having really learned it. I tried a few things, no big deal, had it on my PC, seemed good, and then I decided to go move into a VM. And I, so I didn't go straight into a container, and the reason for that is I didn't know the applications, hadn't worked in the language in 10 years, didn't know the systems. It, for starters, bought me time to learn and to come up to speed on everything. But the second thing that it did is, it allowed me to change the operating system. If I couldn't change the operating system, how could I get it in a container? There were a lot of problems too, just getting it into that VM. And then I figured once I got anything running in, and then I installed Docker engine, 
community edition. They've changed the names, they did rebranding. If I could get anything running in that, then it was time to go put in the budget and say, okay, now we need enterprise because we do need high availability. So what was gonna make the project a no-go? Those black lines from that, that slide a couple ago is the message bus has to work. So I got the message bus, installed it in the VM, brought up my first container, installed it in the container manually, and made sure that I could talk from any to any. And we're running version six, backwardly compatible to five, and went to my boss and said, hey, works. And he said, well, maybe we should think about migrating to version eight and getting current. So I ran the test again, from any to any, worked great. So the biggest deal breaker was now gone. And then the next part was, can I start each of these applications from the command line? The answer was no. Uh, it is a script that starts up all of the applications. It's about a thousand lines long. It has multiple config files. It does rem shells and then more config files and more scripts. And my first thought when I saw that was, who wrote this? And I am not putting it in a container was my second. So I had a, a bit of work there ahead of me. Migrating the Java version forward was not as easy as it sounds. Uh, tried that. At one point, I had four people in my cube taking a look at trying to figure out what was wrong with the JDK. And uh, lastly, we live and die by the application log files. Everything that happens to a wafer or a set of wafers, which we call a lot, we need to know because they're checked periodically, but they're also checked at that final step before going out to the customer. If there's something wrong before it reaches the customer, we have to go back in time and figure out what happened. So we can trace from the moment the silicon enters our fab to when it leaves. So very important. So here was the, here was the great plan. Get it into the community edition. Uh, key point, small steps forward. They don't have to be perfect. They have to be going in the right direction. My first container was 1.6 gig. I had copied off, I yeah, know, really big. I had copied what I had done on the VM, got it to run in a container, and I called that good enough to start the process to ask for the money for enterprise. The next step was make it smaller. And honestly, that was a, a brute force. How do I know what libraries are needed? How do I know what environment variables are needed? Because on servers, everything for all applications is sitting there. So I would remove something, shut it down, start it up. Hey, it still works, I must not need that. And continue that process until I got it down, 335 meg. So I was very pleased with that. So this is the path I actually walked, and so I don't want you to think, oh wow, that sounds like it was pretty easy. It wasn't. Uh, there were times I thought I was never going to get it to run in the VM, and then I thought I was never gonna get it to run in a container. And it's not Docker's fault. Um, when you've got these old applications, there's a lot going on, and it takes a lot of factors to bring it forward. And I had a series of failures, and, and when I talk about failures, failures are not a bad thing. Failures mean that's not the right path, pivot, find another. And so either there was a solution or I had to go find an alternate path on all of these. And they weren't easily identifiable. There were breadcrumbs. So a breadcrumb isn't a slice or a loaf or a bag that says, here's the manufacturer, you can go, you can go talk to them and here's the expiration date. Uh, it became follow the breadcrumbs. And you know, Google is pretty handy. All Google provided was more breadcrumbs. There weren't any answers because of the age of the stuff I was working with. As I thought those top three across the top were low-hanging fruit, turns out there was no low-hanging fruit at all. On that library at the bottom, there was one, it just wasn't compatible. It runs on HP, it doesn't run on Linux. So I contacted the uh, author and said, so do you have a 32-bit compatible Linux version of this library? Thankfully he did. And so here's examples of why you need to know your applications. Uh, it, there were a lot of problems. Had I, had I already been experienced in this environment, I would have been able to overcome some of these faster. Uh, I ended up in object files, digging through seed libraries, digging through jar files, uh, learning an, kind of a dead but very useful scripting language. I downloaded and uh, compiled legacy compilers, and the kind where you get something and, well, that's not enough, it has dependencies. You go get those, you download, you install, install, you compile, it has dependencies, and you just keep going, and then you get to the end and discover you can't get there from here. And uh, that's what I ran into with the message bus. And it really did feel like dead end after dead end. And that bottom one, there was nothing on the HP servers that indicated there was a POSIX version I needed to be concerned about, but that error was corrected by setting the POSIX version in the VM tonight September of 1992. 
So more fun errors. Uh, that top one had to do with the message bus. I needed to be able to send and receive, and that was the big test at the beginning, but I did it on the command line. I would send, and I would receive, and I would send, and I would receive. Great. What about point to point? I want to send a message, and I want to wait for a reply. For that, I needed to write a little program. Rather than take the big things we had and get them running, make the problem smaller. Let me create a little program that does just the message sending. That's it. Uh, they had three libraries that you could choose from. There was C, there was Perl, and there was Java. I don't like Perl, so that cut that one off. Everything else was Java, and I kind of like C. So I tried doing it with C, uh, ended with uh, the Indian errors, so we had to bail on that one, and I did finally settle with Java. So when you are installing in a Docker file, you do the apt-get install minus Y, and you're off and running. That's not the case here with this message bus. The install file was a script. Go back to the year 2000. And it was you spacebar through a EULA, you tell it what directory you want to install in, and then you answer some yes and no questions, and then it installs. So I wrote a series of different things to try to get this installed from within a Docker file. Couldn't make any headway, and Dave and Mark said, hey, what about using expect? Because it will record what goes on in an X term exactly. So everything, every character, every escape sequence, everything you need. So I, ran, I did that, threw it in the Docker file, and still didn't work. And the reason for that is that EULA was this long, like all EULAs, and if you have 80 characters on a line, and then your carriage return line feed, what's the size of that X term in a Docker build engine? It needed to be exact. So I ripped out the first part of the code, replaced it with a while loop that chewed up until I could find the end of the EULA, and then I used the rest of the script. And that was amazing, because that getting that installed, because I had put that error off, and put it off, and put it off, because I could go into a container and install it manually. And when you get to 500 containers, you're probably not going to want to do that. So I, I did leave that one till the end. There were problems with the JVM. Uh, there was a, an odd one of, uh, I put a file in the repository and I couldn't get it back because it was too big. I thought, why did you let me put it in there then? Because I need it back. And then the last one, we're going to go over. This is the last error. This is an example of a breadcrumb. You see that red part over there, the inet piton? Well, this was on the container. It was running in a VM at this point, just in a straight Ubuntu VM. So I've got an Ubuntu container, and I can't get this to come up. And I still have them ident identical as they can be. I thought they were identical. I started looking at system files because I was desperate. So I turned up the verbosity, ran it again, dug through the log files, followed this core dump to the code that I had. There's a lot of code. We have libraries, and we don't have the code for them. And thought, hmm. What if I take the IPv6 addresses out of Etsy hosts? That was actually the solution. Once those I, um, addresses, those IPv6 addresses were moved from Etsy hosts, it ran, and I bound it off to my manager's office and said, can I have some money? Docker file. Now, this Docker file is actually 229 lines long. There's a lot involved. Now, that doesn't count. That counts the, the, the little blue comment line, so you could take out some of those, because uh, I do leave comments behind me. I don't believe in self-documenting anything mostly because I've read a lot of other people's really bad code over the years. So you can see here, I'm having to install the whole JDK, the whole kit and caboodle. I could not get anything out of Docker Hub that would work. I tried every single thing. Wasn't going to happen. That was unfortunate, too, because I thought it would have been easier. And yes, we have Vim and Bash, and there's my POSIX version. And the reason there's Vim and Bash is uh, we have Trust issues, I need to know I can see those log files. Yes, they're out on an NFS mount, that's the plan, but what about in the container? Can I see over on the NFS mount, and can I see in the container at the same time that they look the same? Eventually, the bash and the VIN will go away because you should never need to log into a container. But in the beginning, remember, no impact to manufacturing. I have to be very careful before I release. And I know at the beginning I was talking about that horrible script, and my goal was no scripting. Bottom line, there's a script there. It does two things. Rips out the IPv6 addresses out of Etsy host, and then runs the start command. So it's not nearly as bad. So here's where we started, and here's where we're going. 
Um, I have had uh, those three main applications up and running since the holidays. So we will be moving all of them into uh, the enterprise edition. Right now they're still um, not in enterprise. We have enterprise up and running. Uh, we got that up and running last week. And since I'm here, it probably wasn't a good idea to start everything up and walk away. I didn't want to get called. And then our equipment controllers, I'm splitting them off from the drivers and putting them one each to a container so that when we do go to upgrade them or replace them, they can be picked off one at a time. By the end of June, one server should be off. By the end of October, they will all be off. Uh, we are going to be contracting out to those C drivers. Those will all be replaced. And then as a feature, the team came up with this, and I'm only on the periphery. Remember that I was talking about make the problem smaller and write a little program to do that send and receive? Turns out that was really useful learning. I'm using it to write unit tests, which turned into integration tests. So when we do this move, we have a way to do some validation. And at the same time, Dave is writing some expect ones on his side to do the same thing. So what we've done already is we know we can get 9.4 off the same server and into a VM because we've done it in the test system. So we know we can have them on one in a VM, one on HPUX. Then in October, end of October, it's targeted for Halloween. I'm going to go dressed as a, a Jedi for that. And we get three hours. So we are doing some mocks right now. And our goal is 10 mocks in a row that are flawless before we get to this, and we've got a little check sheet that says this is a go, this means it's a no-go, because we can't impact manufacturing. Them giving us three hours, they can kind of run without this for an hour if they know ahead of time and load up. Three hours is a long time to them, so we've got to decide very quickly where we're going. A uh, couple of team members are helping us move from CVS to Git. Uh, my goal is to bring in some CI, CD, uh, some big data and microservices, because there are so many other things that we do that provide information to R&D and to the different engineers. Uh, it's very important. Last one, those guys up there, I haven't had a chance to look at those yet, but I've been told that they're tied to the hardware, but I don't actually think that's the case. I think it just needs to be in the 80 characters because it's talking to COBOL. So we'll see. Uh, either way, we're going to find a way to deal with that. Remember that 0.5 from earlier? I contacted a former employer because Wayne was the editor of this book. And I had lost my copy of it. I used to work for him. So I called him and said, do you have a copy of that book? I think I need it. Because I was thinking at that point, how am I going to do HP 9000 emulation? It can't be that hard, right? Not after what I've experienced with porting to Docker containers, really old stuff. So he, instead of sending me the book, he said, why don't I put you in contact with the primary author? So I called him, set up a meeting with our team, and found out we don't have just one path. We have three. We can get refurbished. We knew this. We can get refurbished Itanium. Those are the RX servers, and have them basically be backwardly compatible so we can take our, bi our, our old OS, our old binaries, throw them on there, and they'll run. Next Wednesday, though, I have a demo with a company. They're going to show the whole team. They're actually doing HP 9000 PA risk emulation. Now, it's been rumored that it's in a container, but I don't know that for sure. But I'm really hopeful, because then the whole WSM serves, I may just immediately move them. If that, if that works, then I'm just going to port them as is and then start picking those off one at a time. So here's what we have up and running right now. We just have test things running it, test copies in the test environment. Uh, so we've got 10 enterprise nodes and two community addition. The one load balancer is for the three UCP nodes. The other load balancer is for the DTRs. And then we've got four worker nodes. I suspect that's going to grow. And so uh, for us, uh, getting off the aging hardware, keeping the software that we have that works, migrating the things that make sense, rewriting the things that make sense, and then in the case of the database, just splitting it off and moving forward. I don't know when the message bus upgrade is coming. But getting us into Docker containers, this really sets us up for the future, to be able to add new services, potentially to be able to move to the cloud, and, and that's really my goal, right? We want to look to the future, build the right thing, build it correctly, make sure there's a plan for the future. And uh, so that's, that's it, and uh, thank you for coming.
I tried to, I rushed through it a little bit, but it happens. I, uh, I do, I did, I just opened up a hallway track at the end of lunch today because the first hallway track closed within about two hours, so I didn't want to open it up. So if you're interested, if you've got any questions, if you've been porting, if you've been taking legacy apps, please come talk to me. I'd love to hear what you're doing. I'd love to hear, because I have a lot more legacy apps I'm going to be moving forward, and I'd love to share some information with you and, and learn from you at the same time. And then, any questions? So, does anyone have any questions? Uh, hello. <laughs> so uh, it, it sounded like you were kind of the driver inside your company for making this kind of a move. And I was just wondering, first of all, like how many engineers were you talking about and, and what kind of challenges did you run into with trying to get your engineering teams and other people in your organization on board with this? I have an unlimited list. Uh, the number of us in IT uh, were actually losing one person so around 12 that are in IT, we're IT automation, so we're kind of a little bit of both. So you've got networking, PC support, and then the automation team. And so we're kind of, you kind of think of us as two groups, and we have one individual who's got one foot in both worlds. Uh, the biggest challenge was getting buy-in from my manager and being able to show him that I can get it to run in a container. And that was why I was going for small steps forward. Because if you can show forward motion, you're more likely to get buy-in because you have to plant the seed and then keep watering it, and eventually it grows. That was my plan, at least. Uh, when it comes to moving from waterfall to agile and scrum, that's just hard. I don't have any pat answers for you there. Uh, you know, I, I've asked them to read the scrum guide. I think one of them has, and because uh, their comments, well, we have you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not enough. <laughs> and I don't think anyone's read the Agile, Man Agile Manifesto. And I just keep trying to bring in the concept of continuous improvement. Because we can always improve the way we're doing things. So does that answer your question? Any other questions? I know I can't see. I'm totally blind up here, those lights. <laughs> I do want to know what you got the, that Docker image down to in the end. Was it still a gig? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, um, what size was that Docker image when you were done? Oh, 335 meg. Nice. So much smaller, and there's a lot of libraries in it. How many lines of code? Or Docker file? Oh, we probably have 30 libraries sitting in there, and they're all Java files. I was just curious if you're running on-prem or if you were using some of the public cloud providers. We're all on-prem. On-prem now. Which is why I was able to go out and say, okay, I want to install version 8. And uh, I didn't make a straight jump. I had to go 1.4, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 to bring the code forward. And for the future, are you guys looking to go towards one of the public cloud providers or? I'm sorry, it's echoing. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you, are you planning to go towards one of the public cloud providers in the future? Or? Uh, the team is not ready for that. You mentioned cloud, and it's a little scary. So mm -hmm. we're actually running uh, vSphere VMs oh, okay. on premise. Okay. Thank you. Good news. You can eventually move your workloads in VMware, you know, out to the cloud. Yeah. With their partnerships. Yeah, and that's part of the reason we went with the, the, v, the VMs there is because it was already there. And yeah, they had a, like I said, I looked at the vSphere integrated containers, but... Uh, Docker was prepared, so. Yep. Anyone else? I mean, I can talk to her all day. <laughs> I have so many questions. Well, go ahead, ask them, Trish. Uh, well, I guess it's more of a comment. Uh, I, I'm a solutions architect. I work with a bunch of customers. Um, I was just working with a customer recently, and they were dealing with legacy windows. So this isn't even HPUCs can converting. This is legacy Windows. And they went through, they also are a Docker EE customer, and they went through the process kind of like how you explained of putting their legacy COTS app inside of a container. And it was, in the end, the image is 20 gigs. And I think it's a couple hundred lines for that Docker file. And that's actually a bunch of PowerShell scripts underneath the covers. Whoa. 
at what point do you think you would be you would decide it's not worth it to move it to a container? I almost decided it with the ones that I had, actually, uh, simply because of the amount of time that it took. Uh, if I was going to have to install more software than I already did, if that image, to me, the 1.6 gig image was too big. If it was going to be at 1.6 gig, I was going to say, we're just going to have to do VMs. I can't do it. And so if, if to me, if it crossed over 500 megs, I was still whining and complaining at 335. But I went through individual directories. OK, down this directory, we don't need anything down there. Prune that off in the OS. We don't need it. And I did that across the board and could not get it any smaller. How long did it take you to figure all of this out? Well, altogether, it took a year. Now, that's a little longer than it should have taken. I was out for two months because I tore my shoulder and I was, yeah, I had to be screwed back together. And, uh, and then my husband and my daughter got cancer, and so I missed even more time. So if none of that had happened, it would have been more like six months. Okay. But it took a year because I had stuff going on. Any other questions? There we go. I knew if I kept talking, someone would. Uh, this question is about the kind of applications you have containerized. Are they applications talking to the tool through SexJam? There is a lot of echo up here. I really am having. Can I just come down there? Yeah. We'll do it that way. Because <laughs> then I can hear better. Okay. And I can get out of the lights. I can't see. Uh, yeah. Okay, so everybody else yeah, they can okay, hear you. So now I can hear you. I come from a very similar background on yeah. the wafer factory. So the containerized applications are they actively interfacing to the tools through SexJam or also be sending messages through the Workstream message bus? Uh, we use uh, the message bus. Workstream talks. Nothing, Workstream never talks directly to the tools. So it's the tools through those top three, through the equipment controller to the driver, and then depending on the tool, it's either Sex2 or HSMS, and those actually go through a terminal server. Right. So to what get are, down to them. So the containerized applications were you were able to migrate these uh, functionalities into that. Yes. Okay. Took a bit. Oh, I can't take the microphone. That's Trish's. Uh, <laughs> this is mine. Any other questions? What benefits are you doing for CE? Uh, for CE, the only reason we're doing the, uh, for we need high availability. We run twenty four seven. We can't go down. And if something does go down, we need the support. Uh, but we're a small group, and you got 12 people all together, and it's 24 hours a day. There are no days off. And I don't do nights and weekends if I can help it. And the, the trade off really was high availability. Um, you talked about the testing that went into uh, the components that were migrated to containers before the switchover happened during the three-hour window you had when um, you could do that. We and haven't you... actually done it yet. That's the end of October, October 31st. Okay. And I was wondering, you mentioned how um, writing like the expect scripts to be able to talk to the messaging bus um, was a big part of being able to write good automa automated uh, functionality testing. And I was wondering, did you have to like mock any of the other dependent services that weren't going to be moved to containers, like the big, um, mm -mm. Uh, or, or, or were you just kind of able to test them in a way where they didn't depend on the things that weren't going to get moved? Yeah, thankfully I was able to test them. We did have a small testing piece, and I could send messages from the command line into the program. And if I could do a, a, a command and get the right response back, I called it good. Cool. And then I de once I did a little bit of that, I ran it in the test environment. And when any of the other engineers were doing testing, they didn't realize that they were using my containers. Oh, OK. And then they said, well, where's my log files? I can't find my log files. <sighs> They're in the containers. You can't have them. <laughs> and you used a, an NFS file share mounted on all the containers for all the logs from the new uh, new services? Yeah, and that is something we are still working on refining it. And I started looking at Splunk today when I was downstairs to see if there is a better way for us to do looking at the log files. Because right now when there's a problem, it's grep, said, knock. Mm -hmm. Splunk sounds a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like less work for my manager. Because uh, he is actually, he's a working manager, and he is the one who spends more time looking in the log files. Uh, and I would say next would be Dave, who does SPC. And then I kind of, I'm, I'm in charge of the, the, those main, main, nine main applications and the user interface. So we kind of have things divvied up. And equipment controllers are spread out. Uh, those are going to be even more spread out, because all 240 of them are going to get rewritten. Java 1.6 is not a good thing. Just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
We can talk about log management later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, does anyone have any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This is awesome. <laughs>